Brought to you by Reuters Plus Content Studios. Sponsored by Mazda. Hello and welcome to Future Energy Talks with me, Andrew Wilson. Throughout the series, I'll be speaking with a wide-ranging mix of industry leaders and sustainability experts who are helping to accelerate our journey to sustainability. Today, we focus on energy transition, the race to net zero, and the collaborations and frameworks necessary to make a sustainable future a reality. If we are to have any chance of achieving the stated climate targets laid out in the Paris Agreement, any hope of keeping one and a half degrees realistic, we need a global effort, the likes of which we've never seen before. But how can countries, public and private companies and multinational bodies work together to decarbonize a 150-year-old energy system while simultaneously keeping the lights on and ensuring no people or communities suffer unnecessarily? And to help provide some of those answers, we have Francesco La Camera, Director General of the International Renewable Energy Agency with us. IRENA is an intergovernmental agency mandated to facilitate cooperation, advance knowledge and promote sustainable use of renewable energy. Francesco, welcome. Good to talk to you. Thanks for joining us. My pleasure. My pleasure. Given energy transition and the complications with that, its progression and feasibility, how realistic is a target of net zero by 2050? Uh, we, in our outlook, uh, we build the scenario that may allow the international community to get net zero by 2050. Our world energy transition outlook make clear the efforts that has to be made and uh, is uh, also providing uh, not only targets, but also policies to reach those targets. If I can say in, uh, in one minute, we have been asked now for a couple of years to triple the installed capacity of renewables each year. Now the designated president of the COP took our number, said that we have to triple the installed capacity of renewables each year until 2030. And the number to be translated in, uh, in gigawatt is the 1000 gigawatt per year that we have to, to, to install. So this is our number to keep the 1.5 ops alive. The issue of equity has always been a big one raised at the COP discussions, what they might call a just transition for people and communities. Can we bring developing countries with us as the same speed as developed countries? We have no other option. And uh, when we talk about the just transition, we have to understand exactly the concept. So the just transition is a, a path from one step to a next step. And in this case, what makes us thinking that a just transition is making, is happening, is we will be able to reduce the standing inequalities in the world, having in the future with a new energy system, a world that is less unequal than today. This is the meaning of just transition for ourselves. And do you get the feeling that all nations in the world today buy into the idea of a just transition, both the advanced countries and those following behind? So naturally the political willingness seems to be, to be there. We also, in our outlook, we try to uh, provide the elements to build in this promise to become those promised realities. We're learning more and more as we have these discussions every year, the importance of innovation and the importance of entrepreneurs. What does IRENA do in terms of encouraging entrepreneurship in the global community? So it's what we are doing daily. And uh, we have recently come up with a new report on innovation. We will have uh, our annual Innovation Week in Bonn, where we'll present all the re innovation related to the energy transition. And we are trying to translate uh, this innovation in our uh, support uh, to countries in their planning, in, uh, uh, I'd say, design their energy future. And all the different innovations that we hear about today, 
carbon capture, tidal power, all the different technologies that people are developing in this race to bring down the carbon in the atmosphere. Is there one particular technology that excites you the most? You know, I'm not excited by any single technologies. In which sense? I think the renewables provide a general approach to building a new clean energy system. I think there is no doubt that we are moving to a new energy system that will be largely dominated by renewables, complemented by hydrogen, mainly green, and the sustainable use of, uh, of biomass. So that the renewables provide for an holistic approach. So just to give an example, hydropower could be the most important batteries to make our uh, grid system more flexible and more balanced, for example. So the use of the combined use of renewables may provide for a better resilience of, of the energy system provided for the energy security that we need. Speaking of that holistic approach, I imagine that an organization like yours, IRENA, is in the middle of trying to coordinate, facilitate, encourage, even persuade partnerships and collaboration. That's extremely important. How difficult is that to bring different governments and different organizations together? Uh, when you work, never is easy. So we know that we have to work and work hard. What as ARENA we are trying to present also in the view of uh, the COP28 that is coming uh, at the end of this year in Dubai, is to present not only data targets, so on where we are, where we should be, and other, but we are also trying to build a new narrative. In our point of view, uh, we need to renew and to strengthen the structures that sustain an energy system. I am uh, thinking about the uh, physical structure. We need that uh, the sea grid, land grid, sea route, trade routes, the port, Everything should be adapted to sustain the new energy system that is coming as the legal and policy environment is still looking to the past. The market design is still designed for the old uh, 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 energy system and still the institutional capacity and the professional skill are not there. So we are presenting as a new narrative the breaking all these three barriers that are impeding an uh, acceleration in the energy transition, because everyone agrees that renewables is the most convenient way to produce el electricity, the most uh, clean, the one that provided through the decentralization a more uh, a system that is more secure and more resilient to shock. So we need to break this barrier. And coming back to your question to the just transition, excuse me if I take a minute, this narrative could be also able to rewrite the way international cooperation works, where in our point of view, the multilateral financial system should be engaged totally in the building of the infrastructures, physical infrastructure that will sustain the new system. This particularly important country in continent like Africa, the Southeast Asia, where the building of the structure could also create opportunity for development and put in place a virtuous cycle where development and new clean energy system may work together and pushing each other. Let's take that example of Africa, for example. We are starting to understand the dynamic of that continent in terms of uh, their need to establish better functioning economies, better economic relations with the outside world, the enormous potential for renewables, but at the same time, the temptation to explore fossil fuel alternatives and start creating income for countries by going down the fossil fuel route. In your view, what is the most important dynamic in the African continent in terms of the energy transition? Uh, we think that uh, this idea of, uh, of uh, uh, use, uh, say, the fossil fuel as a development exercise is losing ground in the last uh, in the last month and the last years. So we think that uh, there is a clear understanding that this uh, at uh, benefit of all the continent to go as fast as possible to renewables. Africa has 1,000 
the potential of producing electricity that they need through renewables. So they are the most important powerhouse for green hydrogen in the world. What is important to understand, and, uh, and, and this come back to what I've already said, responding to your previous question, is that Africa needs the infrastructure to put uh, all its potential uh, at a benefit not only of uh, the African continent, of the African people, but also for the world. Well, there are challenges to that infrastructure vision, aren't there? One is the, the outdated aid model that exists across the African continent, but also it's a question of culture and politics as well as technology. Are we making any progress in that? And that brings us back to the partnership question, I guess. Uh, this is something that uh, we really hope the COP28 can make the difference. So focusing on the barrier the, uh, affecting uh, the development of uh, renewables in, uh, worldwide, but especially in Africa, could be important. As uh, <clears throat> for the discussion on the reform of the multilateral financial system, it will be not only a way to ask for more concessional uh, fund or grant, but also for what? In my point of view, as after the Second World where Europe may flourish again, thanks to the support he received in terms of infrastructure, we have to put in the game uh, investment in infrastructure, development, clean energy system, moving in a circular way towards a, a higher level. Interesting you should mention Europe because Europe is, if you like, a, a world leader in many ways. People look to Europe for the kind of technology that's going to take us into a renewable energy-driven world. It seems that Europe's progress has been accelerated by the war in Ukraine. Do you think that's a fair judgment? Is that what historians will conclude when they look back? You know, this is uh, uh, for a very simple reason. You know, Arena came uh, with uh, this proposition uh, when uh, the, the war started. The, uh, the world has made government recognize that a centralized energy system based on fossil fuel didn't provide the energy security, the energy security needed. So having a decentralized energy system based on renewables with more actors in the market provide for a more secure and resilient energy system. Uh, this this makes the case for government to accelerate the building of this new decentralized and clean energy system. This is what happen in uh, Europe, but it's happening everywhere in the world. In the United States, with the new legislation they put in place, but also in China, in Japan, in India. I think everyone understood that the energy security is based not anymore on fossil fuel, but on renewables. I want to talk about North America in a moment, but first of all, just going back to the Africa question, is Middle East, North Africa, does that count as a different region when we're considering the energy transition? You know, I think that uh, here they started, uh, the UAE is leading in this respect. They already started to invest worldwide in renewables with Mazda. So they made uh, their own uh, uh, gains and they also have the, the biggest uh, solar plants and renewable plants in the region. Saudi Arabia is, uh, is there. And all the countries in the region are moving fast, also building of uh, uh, the richness they, that came from uh, the old energy system. So they are making the investment to uh, restructure the energy system. In Africa, it's a slightly different because they don't have uh, this background that has been here. But uh, still, the work of uh, the multilateral energy system uh, may provide the infrastructure that is needed to attract more private investment. I think all the companies want, want to go and invest uh, in Africa, but they have to be able to sell the energy they provided. And this could be done if we link uh, the infrastructure gain with the uh, development gain, so creating a market in, uh, in uh, Africa that can sustain uh, more renewables coming to the ground. Okay, Francesco, let's take a look at North America. That's perhaps the most complicated one of all. I mean, we know that this current White House administration has massive ambitions for green energy, green investment, a green economy. And yet somehow that seems to have difficulties in the political arena and also the public arena in terms of Americans in the street, their support for such projects. What do you see when you look at the American question? It's a world leader and yet it always seems to somehow falter uh, at certain promises or delivering. You know, I'm, 
I'm quite, uh, I'd say, I think that uh, the United States will lead in the energy transition. Uh, you know, there, there is a, a system that is a mix with the federal and the state competences. And also during the last period where uh, the US were out of the Paris Agreement, many coal plants have been closed because uh, the US is also a, a, a country and a place where the market is important. So already in the past, we have been uh, seen assisting to the closing of coal plants and going for renewables. And now I think that the new uh, legislation uh, will push the country in that direction. What is the first priority in my point of view, if I can say regarding the US, is uh, the infrastructure. Sometimes it, is, it seems uh, not possible to compare uh, US with Africa and say that they have to come with the same uh, uh, solution that we need to invest more in the infrastructure. But I think the distribution system in the United States should be renewed for permitting for allowing more renewables uh, being into, into the grids. And when the infrastructure is there, renewables are the most convenient way to produce electricity without any doubt. And also now uh, US is investing in offshore wind, is investing in green hydrogen. I think it becoming uh, is attracting investment. So I have no doubt that they will be, they will be faster than they've been in the, in the past. So final thought then, Francesco, we've heard all the promises in Glasgow, in Sharm el Sheikh, COP28 as well, and no doubt more promises will come out of that, but it's action that the people of the world are looking for. Looking into the future, a few years down the line, what signs can we look for that we're making progress with our ambitions for energy transition? So, you know that uh, the uh, uh, Egyptian uh, COP has already moved uh, from the pure negotiation also to the implementation the occasion of the COP. And now we have uh, the UAE presidency pushing for, for action. So what could be action to be delivered? In my point of view, the, uh, uh, how to say, the use of our narrative to reshape the way the international cooperation works and giving a clear mandate to multilateral financial system to fund the infrastructure that we need for the new energy system will be a big achievement if this will be done for moving to action. And we also are assisting to concrete step to solve a, a problem like the loss damage. The UAE is pushing for having a solution also on finance. We as ARENA with Master and ADA, we have also our platform that is uh, attracting a lot of interest. The Energy Transition Accelerated Financing Platform for providing real impact on the, on the ground. I, I cannot say if we will succeed or not, but I strongly feel that this will be possible. And my hope this will be that the, this COP will be the turning point from moving to the, from the pure negotiation uh, uh, mood of, uh, of the COP to a more action oriented to the ground. And we have to see the difference now because we have no time. We need a 1000 gigawatts yearly, you know, installed capacity of renewables today not tomorrow. Yes, indeed. Francesco, thanks very much indeed for joining us. Pleasure talking to you. My pleasure. Uh, thanks for having me. Francesco La Camera there. Well, achieving net zero clearly remains a complex issue, but there's plenty more to be explored. Stand by for more in our Future Energy Talk series as we dig deeper into the issue. That's Future Energy Talks with me, Andrew Wilson, streaming now. Brought to you by Reuters Plus Content Studios. Sponsored by Mazda.